Welcome to the Rabbi in the Shrink. This is Dr. Margarita Guri, the Shrink, Dr. Red Shoe, and my very favorite rabbi. Jonas and Goldson. <laughs> the good rabbi has introduced me once again to an amazing individual. Her name is Cordelia Gaffar. She, we, we're nicknaming her Joy. I know that name has begun to take off because she is Joy personified. Welcome, Joy. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> and we're excited that today, the day that we're filming, is the International Day of the Woman. And I think that is no coincidence, and you are known to be a source of empowerment for women all around the globe and any man who identifies as a human being. So that's pretty good. That's a big, big group you can cater to, right? Yeah, it is. <laughs> it also means that I'm allowed to stay on the show in spite of uh, being International Women's Day. Well, Rabbi, <laughs> men are people too. I'm just saying. And, <laughs> and you're one, one of my favorite of those. So Joy is an award-winning individual. She was podcast host of 2019 in London for Unlearning Labels. Um, uh, she was a finalist of the top national influencer in order of the year. Ambassador of Peace, that's impressive. Global Library of Female Authors and a best-selling author of a compilation book. Several people contributed, America's Leading Ladies. She was one of them, and she was well chosen. She's written eight books, four of them by herself, four with others. And one of them is about detached love. And another one is, I think your first was Workout Around My Day, correct? Yes, correct. And then the, the two podcasts. So your old podcast, I get the order mixed up. The new one is Unlearning Labels. Ah, yes. the award one was for the other one, right? Yes. For the yes. free to be. Sorry, I got that wrong. That's okay. I was going to correct you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. So please do tell us, tell us about Joy and how did you get here? You know, I love that question because um, for a couple of years, actually, when I met um, the rabbi, I'm going to call you the rabbi. That feels weird for me. <laughs> but when I met the rabbi, I was known as the emotions opener. And so uh, recently I went on a deeper, if you can believe it, uh, transformative experience and, and identify that emotion as joy. And, um, and so people started calling me joy because they're like, you are a joy bubble. Like being near you is like feeling joy. And what's even better is like, I have a whole vocabulary surrounding all of it, right? So <laughs> now I'm the world's best joy monger yeah, that's a word. And um, I create joy bonding. So. <laughs> so tell us about joy monger, someone who facilitates something, brings it to. And tell us about joy bonding. What is that? Yeah, joy bonding actually is a really serious thing, especially in the business world, you see, because most often people, they want to bond uh, for a specific exchange. And I feel like when we come into conversations, it's about the elevation of what it is that we're bringing to the world, right? So our mission. And if we, if we come into that conversation from how can I create more joy? How can I um, use this mission so that it elevates humanity as opposed to um, let's see how much money I can make out of this. You'll be a lot more profitable. You've, you've touched on, on some of my favorite topics all at once, uh, Cordelia. <laughs> um, the com connecting joy with mission, in, uh, it's a topic that, that I just love to go off on. I won't go too long. But in, in uh, biblical Hebrew, there are eight words that translate as some form of joy or happiness. And you know, and certainly in American culture, we are obsessed with happiness, goes all the way back to the Declaration of Independence and the inalienable right, the pursuit of happiness. And I think the problem we make is we don't define what happiness is or where happiness comes from. And then what you've just encapsulated so succinctly is that it comes from a sense of purpose. Uh, in the 12 step programs of recovery, they start with recognizing something greater than yourself. Because if my life's all about me, then how much am I really able to be by myself? 
But when I become part of something greater than myself, now I have that sense of purpose. All those Hebrew words, if you look at their etymology, they all have some connection with progress or growth or purpose. And that, that sense of purpose that I'm fulfilling a mission that I'm contributing to a to something larger than myself, that's what fills us with this sense of joy that really makes life worth living. And that infused into a business context is going to drive success in the way that really nothing else will. 100%. I mean, that that's the only way to go into business. And, and I think what you, what I love about what you said is it is our vocabulary that creates the world, right? And so, you know, just the fact that how many words was it you said? Eight. Eight. Yeah. Eight words, right? That's like yeah. a lot. And it's how a many talk words on do the way, but... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm looking for that. Um, and, and there's only like one in English, you know, joy. Um, <clears throat> and so I've had to expound on that, obviously, by creating joy bonding and joy mongering. And so, um, you know, another part of joy bonding is um, trust, right? Uh, we have to have trust in business. And I feel this is something that really rose to the surface in the past few years is the the lack of trust that we had in our organizations. You know, we, we talked about it extensively last year on Unlearning Labels on that particular podcast because there's like AI being used. Um, what was the other one called? Uh, the software to watch employees. Um, it's not coming to me right now. It's not called spyware. It has another name, but we, we talked Surveillance, about Surveillance, soft- maybe. Yeah, it's, it's some, it, it will come to me as soon as we're done recording, of course. Um, <laughs> but it's, there's a software that companies were using, you know, to see whether or not their employees were being productive. And, you know, sadly, a lot of women, you know, left the workforce because it was just the accountability was too much. I mean, never mind all the things going on at home. And the funny thing about that is we know that women tend to be a lot more productive because they are in the habit of juggling a lot more responsibility. And, you know, it, but they also are conditioned to, um, prove that they're more than their male counterparts and so uh you know this is one of the places where if they're you know just it sucks the life out of someone when they're not trusted you know it's all that tracking software that can erode a sense of trust and also erode creativity if we're too worried about having to monitor every moment whether it's automatic or not we may not be free to be creative. Exactly. Yeah, you know, they have it for, for students too, the, the online test taking. And, and it's actually, it's, I mean, it sounds so, like something out of a dystopian novel. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it tracks your eye movement. So if you look away from the screen for, for more than a moment, then you're suspected of cheating. And just the knowledge that I'm being surveilled with such intensity is itself so um sort of soul crushing it's joyless it's It's joyless joyless. well but it all it also it becomes it depresses the performance on the test (laughs) in the in this bizarre irony of we want to make sure that people are actually being tested are actually being honest and so we are sort of influencing them with the sense of distrust that that depresses their their performance i mean it's it's bizarre so what is the secret to, ins- to the joy bonding and to helping cust- um, uh, different corporations be stronger and better and with happier and more productive employees? What is your secret? Yes. So it's at the individual level. So you, you used a phrase there, free to be, right? So my free to be show really gets into the joy and presence of a person. Um, so one thing that we need to find is what helps you to nurture your joy by understanding nurturing yourself in the first place so there are 
five tips for uh, self nurturing, right? And it's really basic, you're, you're going to think like, wait, this is because you're a mom, right? So you have to sleep. That gives you joy. <laughs> well, and it also, right, it, it's the best way to detoxify your system because it's the number one metabolism stabilizer, right? So allowing your employees enough rest and, <clears throat> you know, I mean, there's actual sleep, which is the physical rest, but then there's different forms of rest, create, creative rest, spiritual rest, um, uh, and just having time to close your eyes and center yourself you know there's grounding techniques and different things like that so when organizations offer spaces um, they'll have like mindfulness rooms or mindfulness areas to allow you to rest um, another thing so here's where my nutrition background comes in as you mentioned my first book was work out around my day making sure that you're eating high quality foods because you really are what you eat like and your food is your medicine so when you eat a certain quality of food um, that will provide optimal mental function and emotional stability as well of course you have to move right your body because we're actually meant to move we're not supposed to be sitting still all day which is kind of strange and odd, right? Because we do sit at computers most of the time. And fun fact, having a standing desk does not solve the problem. Um, you actually have to go outside in the sunshine and get some vitamin D. And um, it's it's good for your, your bones. It's good for your mental function. So I like I said, these sound like really s super basic things and very necessary things to have high quality employees. Yeah. And what's four and five? We have sleep, nutrition, movement. What are the other two? Just curious. Oh, emotions and thoughts, right? Oh, oh which, okay. Emotions. Which are connected because. Okay. All right. Yeah. Is it chicken before the egg or egg before the chicken, right? So some yes. people believe that it's the way you feel that controls your thoughts, and other people feel that it's the way you think that controls the way you feel I vote whatever for both. yeah i go for both you know why because really what i've noticed is when i think something it's almost like a magnet bringing it towards me and then i can't help but to say that thing so yeah, the truth is that we, yeah, we the have truth. much more control over our thoughts than we do over our feelings and we have even more control over our actions so you know yeah, the, the, the young person's complaint that if I don't feel like doing something that is somehow insincere or hypocritical, <laughs> if, if, I, if I do that, whereas the way to look at it is, is aspirational. I want to be the kind of person who acts in a, in a refined way, in a thoughtful way, in a kind way, in a joyful way. And so I, I consciously act that way. And then my thoughts will start being more aligned with my actions and my feelings will start to develop in a way that's consistent with those thoughts. So recognizing that we have control, and this I think is very much, um, Cordelia, your, 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 your whole approach to recognize how much control we actually have over what we're feeling by taking responsibility to, to reframe and to make a conscious decision to be joyful. Yeah, it's it's like starting with the question, who do I have to be to, right? Who do I have to be um, for a certain outcome? So what are the barriers? I'm a psychologist. And one of the things that we always look at is how do I get in my own way? So what are the barriers that individuals and organizations have to joy? Yeah, doubt, frustration, creating isolation. Um, and uh, I would I would also say um, making individuals feel helpless or hopeless, like they they take the power away from them. Um, and when you do that, it it's just it just takes like one percent of any of those to to diminish the greater qualities of an individual. So. Um, 
I, I think it goes back to the trust, you know, if there was, if people felt that they were in a psychologically safe environment and they could authentically show up to be themselves, they'd feel that they're trusted, respected, and whatever responsibility their um, position in, entails, you know, they, they felt like they had the power to fully be that. I think that that would change a lot. And what you said, they felt like they have the power, but they also actually do have the power. Yes. Some organizations make you feel like you do, but you don't. Right. And so I think it has to be you feel it, but it's also an accurate feeling that you really do. And I'd actually like you to, to expand on that a little bit. The, this term safe space has become uh, commonly hmm. used. And, and I, I used it in an article recently on it where I, I use it in the term, in the sense that it's been used ref, referring to our college campuses, um, where I'm safe from anybody saying anything that could possibly be offensive or disturbing to me. Um, and the woman who responded is from Europe, and she was understanding it in, in the context of, of physical safety and couldn't understand why I was having a problem with it. Right. So it goes back to what you said earlier about the vocabulary we use. But in, if we if we don't want to um, create the the sort of perpetually terrified of making a misstep uh, attitude that can emerge from this you know anything I say could be misinterpreted or misunderstood or misconstrued and, and instead say psychologically safe in that I'm free to express ideas I'm free to pursue thoughts that may not be fully developed. I'm free to, to ask people questions because I want to learn more. And yet we all feel safe because there's an element of trust. And I, 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 can, I trust that my intentions are going to be recognized as good. And I feel safe that I can express myself without being censured because someone misinterprets. So what are the elements of creating that kind of psychological safety? Well, see, I coach individuals who are, are leaders and I just, it, it's, leaders are like role models, right? So if you're coming to work and you're censoring yourself, then by your behavior, by your actions, your team is gonna do the same thing, right? So I just tell um, leaders just, change your vocabulary surrounding it saying look we're going to experiment with this and they get to see you experiment and see you make a mistake <laughs> you know and like be human and then we can all be human together you know I, again it's just the conditioning i feel in our society and when i say our society i mean i work with people in three continents and it's it seems to be a global thing now um, where you can't be human. You have to be perfect. And that's, it doesn't even exist. Like what is perfection? Experimenting is really what we're all doing anyway. Just giving vocabulary to that and identifying and being accurate. Guess what? What you're doing, it's all an experiment. We don't know until the end of the quarter, <laughs> you know? So... Just, Amazing. yeah, you know, and, and so another thing I think about um, is when we talk about psychologically sa psychological safety, yes, you said the, the European woman, she was thinking about physical safety. Well, here's, the, here's a fun fact. Um, I did a talk about this in the Amplify DEI Summit where I was talking about Black women in the workplace, right? And there is a physical and an emotional lack of safety that they feel, you know. Um, I, I've experienced it myself. Of course, I haven't worked in corporate America for 20 years. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, <clears throat> and how, you know, at the same time, I have clients that are currently in corporate America and, and it hasn't changed. And it's like, it's been like 20 years, you know? So um, going into the workplace guarded is a thing. And I told one woman who's a director, I said, experiment with 
you know, just showing up and saying things that you see your male counterparts say and just be exactly who you are and feel how you feel in the moment. And she experimented with that. And guess what happened? Where her staff wasn't compliant and, you know, she felt like there was this passive aggressive thing, especially with some of her male employees, all of a sudden it shifted. And the number one guy that was giving her the most hard time on her team, he he like did a, a 180 and he became, you know, like a constituent for her, you know? Can you give a couple of specific examples in a case like that? Well, it was her vocabulary because she was always coming in work guarded and not giving clear or, you know, instructions. She would just say, you know, did you do that? You know, and sometimes he would be like, you know, I just didn't get to it. Right. So you can hear already there's conversation not happening. Right. It's like this needs to be done by this specific deadline, right? That part, she didn't give him that information. I didn't get to it. There are some, there are some other things that are priorities and I need help with that. So in the end, what he, he started to tell her the things that he needed help with, you know, I, I, I don't have enough assistance with, you know, certain projects. And, and so when she found that out, she says, oh, okay well, let's go over these things. Let me see if I can get some help from other teams. And it just was a, a lack of communication, a lack of understanding, a lack of compassion, and everyone's, you know, pretending something that they, they, they don't need to, they just need to talk. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it's it's worth you know thinking about why what is it that causes us not to be clear. I mean, <laughs> Some I of could, us if, have a natural gift, Rabbi. Yeah, well, yes, and most of them are in office, but the, <laughs> <laughs> or in my chair at home. I don't know why she sits there, but she does. Clarity is hard to come by, um, and if you're looking at um, uh, diversity. The language we use that works with one group might not work with another. So we have to understand who we are and who the various people with whom we're communicating so that we know what might resonate or what might scare them or belittle them or invite them and excite them is not so easy to be clear. As you can tell by what I just said, yes. <laughs> And it's and a choice to be clear too, you know, it is. because it is. I mean, I know like the inner workings of her mind, she was telling me things like, well, if I tell them, I don't know how to do something. Or if I tell them that I don't know what they're supposed to do, you know, it's easier for me to just say, do that rather than to take the time to let them see where I'm flawed. And I'm like, but are you flawed? Or are you just human? You know? Well, you talk about allyship quite a bit, and that goes along with the idea of followership that the rabbi and I talk about from time to time. That there's leaders. Most leaders aren't taught how to lead or taught how to communicate as leaders, no less with a diverse group. And so on top of it with allyship, we have to have the idea that we're all helping the leader lead and the leaders helping all of the followers be leaders, right, and allies. Getting that culture down is not so easy, but it is certainly doable. Clarity is a risk. And as my father used to say, risk greatness. Yeah, it, it really, um, it really matters. I, I mean, I, I like the way you're bringing in allyship and aligning it with followership. That's, yeah, yes. I, that's it. That's very accurate um, because you, really want to empower each person to be their own leader you know yes. that self-leadership is super important for cohesiveness and then everyone can be a reflection of each other and it's not about being competitive or adversarial it's about getting the job done and to have loving civil discussions about where we disagree the rabbi and i love that we love when groups learn to listen, really listen to each other and learn. 
It's also not about um, position or authority. If, I, if I'm the official leader and an underling comes up with a really good idea or suggestion, then I become a follower in the sense that I am now supporting uh, the implementation of the person who took the initiative, the person who came up with the, with the idea. And we're all members of a team that the roles can be fluid to some degree in practice, even if they are fixed in, in, the, in, the, in the structure of the organization and the willingness to shift uh, and adapt and, and allow people to take on different roles can really create a, a vibrant culture that can accomplish extraordinary things. Yeah, I agree. You know, um, I don't have anything clever to say after that. I just agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, he is, he is, um, he often gets me to think into silence. I know that's a concept. <laughs> It doesn't work on podcasts so well, but <laughs> no, no. Hey, that was a good silence you just had. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Our, our listenership just went up. <laughs> yeah, thank you. We like that. It was good for me. It was actually, there was a quick story. Um, a, a student uh, came into a, a rabbi's lecture and, um, and he had a, a new tape recorder. Anybody remember tape recorders? Um, yep. well, yeah, enough, remember so, um, you know, so cell phones that recorded before they had cell phones. Um, <laughs> and this one was voice activated, which was a new thing at the time. And the rabbi, who was not particularly tech savvy, he noticed something different about it. He said, what's, what's with this tape recorder? Why is it different? And the student said, well, it, it responds to your voice and it cuts out the gaps. Oh. And the rabbi shook his head and smiled. He said, the gaps are the absolutely most essential part of the lecture. And, you know, that's something that we have lost. You know, we are, first of all, we're uncomfortable with silence just when we're sitting with people. But in this medium, dead air is considered the kiss of death. Mm -hmm. right? As soon as, as soon as three seconds go by, people will start tapping their, their devices trying to see if, if something's gone wrong. And we don't allow one another time to actually think about what we're saying. So maybe we could introduce a new format of, uh, of podcast where we, we do Silence let people podcast. time to think. Uh, but there is the pause button, so I guess that works too. <laughs> That's so funny. And that's true. Like in speaking right on stage, the pause is like everything. Yes. But like on a podcast, it's just like, wait, is there something wrong with the connection? You know, even my kids, like I record my own commercial breaks on my podcast and they're like, mom, what, why so long of a pause? And I was like, was it like even 10 seconds, you know? And they were like, yeah, that's forever. I was like, 10 <laughs> seconds. Wow. So that's nice that they pointed out it's they're not critical they want to hear more for you that's the good part of that oh yeah they're, they're my marketing team <laughs> i'm like that's is this okay to post is, can i use this <laughs> well we know that there's a good podcast when people do hit the pause either to write <laughs> notes or to think i think that's wonderful so we're going to start a new movement pause for peace yeah um, and have everyone get excited about it <laughs> well, I think we're getting to the point where it's time for the word of the day, good rabbi. And when we come back, we'll have some more thoughts from our speaker. I'd like to introduce the word of the day with one of my favorite quotes that just came to me during this discussion. It's by Robert McCluskey. He said, I know that you believe you understand what you think I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard is not what I meant. <laughs> Okay. I love that. <laughs> and, uh, and you can pause to reflect on that when you have time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've been talking about vocabulary and communication and, and trust and, and, and uh, preconceptions and such. And, uh, and these are all contributors to miscommunication. And on the one hand, we want to be very concise with our words, very accurate, very to the point. On the other hand, we don't want to leave things unsaid 
that need to be set. And striking that balance can be a bit of a challenge. And so this week's word of the day comes to us from our friend uh, Susan Rooks, the grammar goddess, uh, former guest on our show. And the word, if I could pronounce it, is sesquipedillion. Well, that's easy for you to say. It's not. <laughs> sesquipedillion, which means characterized by long words in a way that is often long-winded. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the reason why everybody should read at least a little bit of Hemingway, um, because Hemingway does more with one and two syllable words than uh, almost any author in history. And so as we think we have to use these long, fancy words to sound erudite, uh, to, uh, to impress people, to sound sophisticated, and we end up muddling the message so that whatever we thought we were communicating gets completely lost or even worse, misunderstood. So rather than being, hang on a second, sesquipedalian, <laughs> overly long-winded, um, let's, uh, let's strike that balancing point where we can speak concisely, clearly, but not leave important information unsaid, like your example of the, of the workplace, Cordelia, where um, for whatever reason, we think we think that people will understand what we mean. Uh, it's our job to get the message across. And it's both our jobs to make sure that the message has been accurately received. Yeah, and in this case, it does matter how it lands, you know? <laughs> as opposed to a lot of times we're just like, oh, it doesn't matter how it lands. It matters how it lands because that's the team building piece. Communication is so very key. Yeah, people say, you know, clear communication. Well, if it's not clear, it's not communication. <laughs> yeah, 100%. So um, this is where I get to say, <laughs> You have a final word of wisdom or a call to action, dun, da, da, dun. which is experiment with bonding from a place of joy instead of a place of trauma. Um, we experience life for the elevation of our souls. So allow your experiences to elevate your soul to joy. In terms of, um feeling joy. We talked about having a sense of purpose, um, but there's also an element of uh, having a, a kind of spontaneity and, and, a, and a sort of step back. So, so uh, when, when you want to, when you want to have fun, is there something that uh, you turn to that complements the joy of purpose and work? I think you know what it is because you use the word turn to. I do cartwheels. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now I want a video of this. <laughs> there is one on my Instagram. <laughs> well, I am going to have to look at this. I missed, I can't believe I missed such a juicy morsel. That's wonderful. <laughs> I think that's wonderful. I also think you communicate your sense of joy with the movement of the colors behind you in what you're wearing. I was telling the rabbi we need to get him a kippah that has colors. <laughs> um, but he grapples with a gray, so maybe we should get him something wild and crazy that's gray, you know? Yeah. Or shades of gray. Maybe or it will be a, like an iridescent gray, you know, like bordering on silver. It could even have glitter. <laughs> a scandal. <laughs> Put some in my beard and we'll... <laughs> a distinguished beard. Hopefully someday it'll be all white. That'll be fun. Yeah. That'll it's be going nice. to be all white. Gotta love an all white beard. I, I, I think it says really good things about someone maybe it shouldn't but to me it speaks to some sort of wisdom and patience well, let's certainly hope so and doctor <laughs> what is the last word of wisdom the last word of course is joy we have um our newly nicknamed cordelia gaffar who is joy personified <laughs> and i think that her message is something we can all consider are you ready to allow yourself to give and receive joy. How are you gonna create it? And how are you gonna receive it? 
And some of us are good at creating it. Some of us are good at receiving it. The challenge is, let's do both. And I think if we learn how to think about ourselves as instruments for the greater good, which I believe we are, with a sense of meaning, how can we miss creating and receiving joy? That's all I have to say about that, Rabbi, and joy. It's my thought. Thank you, Cordelia, for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. You've been thank awesome you. and a lot of fun as well. well thank and you, Doctor. And thank you, good Rabbi. We're going to, when this airs, it will no longer be International Day of the Woman, but every day is certainly International Day of Joy. And let's make that happen. This is the Rabbi and the Shrink finishing up a very fun podcast. We'll see you next at, and if you have questions, podcast at the Rabbi and the Shrink. And for Cordelia, who is not yet has joy in it, Cordelia Gaffar, J F F A R. Uh, dot com. G. G. Oh, G. G. Yeah, what did I say? J. I meant G. I'm sorry. G. Well, don't into a Latin me. mode. G a f f a r. dot com, and you can get more information about her. And we'll have links in our notes so that you can find her, her YouTube and her LinkedIn. Everyone, have a joyful day. Thank you for listening to the Rabbi and the Shrink Everyday Ethics Unscripted. To book Dr. Redshu, Dr. Margarita Guri, or Rabbi Yonason Goldson as speakers or advisors for your organization, contact them at therabbiandtheshrink.com. This has been a Dr. Redshu production.